we're here to talk about your city hall project that you did while working for the city. I'd like to introduce you to someone who's super important to me. Everyone, meet my dad. My dad has worked for the city of Milwaukee since 1984 and just recently retired in November of 2019. He was a machinist and a mechanic before then, and he has an amazing experience about Milwaukee history that he was willing to share. So, here we go. I started with the city in 84. I'm not counting that year. I started at water in 85. 95. I spent 12 years over there. So yeah, 97. I used to be a, a machinist for Rexnord Manufacturing Company. And I was laid off in 1982. And um, I could not find a machinist position. And at the time at Rexnord, you had to have 25 years of seniority uh, to still be employed by them. And I had four years and nine months. So I was laid off permanently. It was May of 82 and the following week, I took a job, a, a cleaning job for a services and uh, the economy was bad working. I could not find a job in my field. So I applied for a seasonal labor job with the city of Milwaukee. <laughs> in 1984, I became a seasonal laborer. They were hiring 60 laborers in 1984 and 60 laborers in 1985. And when I took the test in 84, to become a seasonal laborer for the city. There was over 1,200 applicants for a laborer's job that paid $7.16 an hour. That's what I worked at the city for. And out of 1,200, you were one of 60 that got a job. Yeah. Well, that's pretty good. I think so. Well, when you started working at the the machine shop on Canal Street. It wasn't long after when you started working on this project, right? Correct. How long were you there when you were asked to do this project? Hmm. Less than six months. That's pretty quick. Were you excited about the project? Yes, but I was also nervous. Why? Because I haven't been machining in over 12 years. Since my layoff from Rexnord, I did no machining at the city of Milwaukee water department. So I was, a, I was, I was nervous, but yet excited because uh, this was something that I liked doing. And what was the, what was, what did the job entail? Why did it, why did it need to be fixed? And what were you, what did you have to do to fix it? Well, I could, like anything, uh, this was out of sight, out of mind, as far as the workings of the unit. So there was no maintenance done on it for many, many years. The conditions up in the clock tower uh, can be brutal. It's non-heated, uh, it's damp, uh, it freezes, and there's a lot of factors working against mechanical equipment in the clock tower. So it's exposed to a lot of the elements, and when it's not properly maintained, things break. Yes. So how was the clock non-functioning for a number of time, years, or was it just poorly functioning? Poor, poorly functioning. Okay. I removed, I, I stepped my first clock face, I, I started on out of the four is the south clock face the south facing clock face. And we had to remove the, the hour and the minute hand and actually open up a segment in the top, near the 12 o'clock segment of the clock face, open that up, there's panels that are removable. We opened up that panel and 
at the six o'clock uh, hour of the clock face. So what we did is we ran a, a block and tackle out the 12 o'clock um, opening in the face and attached a cable to the minute hand and I reached out of the six o'clock opening in the clock face to undo the attachment of the minute hand to the mechanism. And um, once that was done, we, un we unthreaded the minute hand shaft from the minute hand. It became free and we, we, we raised it, we picked it and raised it through the 12 o'clock opening, swung it in and then brought it back down inside the clock tower and then laid the laid a, a minute hand out and we did the same thing with the hour hand. So you had to create two openings in the clock face to remove the minute and the hour hand. What, what were you rebuilding? It's, it's the mechanism inside the clock tower that the hour and minute hand attached to. And it's a series of gears. The hour hand, of course, is gear reduced to the minute hand. They all work together in sequence. They're separate. There's a separate minute hand shaft and there's, there's a separate hour hand shaft. Mm -hmm. Every 60 times the minute hand goes around, the, the, the hour hand will move one hour, exactly one hour mm -hmm. you know, in a one hour segment. It's geared that way. Oh, remember I talked that gears reduce the motor speed 900, reduce it, the motor speed 900 times to keep the clock on time. So you didn't have to fix the hands, you just you had to fix right. the mechanism that makes the hands operate properly. Right. Okay. Yeah, the electricians at the city of Milwaukee fixed the hands, and what they did is they converted them to LED lighting, and that allowed them to uh, not have to replace the bulbs in the hour and minute hand because this the face back then was not backlit like it is now so the only thing that was lit was the hour and minute hand and that's how you told you could tell time at night i like working on mechanical things and i want to understand how they work so combining the two this was a job that was perfect for me because I had some machining background, I also had mechanical background, and you put the two together and that's what made this work. So it's a dream job. Yeah. Uh, the main thing I was worried about is uh, having the minute hand drop onto the pavement below or the hour hand when, they were, when we were dismantling it from the minute and hour hand shaft. You know. And you had to do that on all four sides, yes. all four faces. Yeah, the north facing face wasn't too bad because there's there's a roof section there from City Hall, but it's still a part or parts could have bounced off the roof and went down to the pavement below. But the west facing, the south facing, and the east facing, it was direct contact with pedestrians below. Why didn't they close off the sidewalk? I don't know that. I asked them to, and I was told, just work careful and be safe. I wanted that. What would happen if you dropped, like, a wrench from that height, and it hit someone? Well, if it hit them in the head, it would probably have killed them. So you had a lot of pressure to operate safely. Yeah, that's what gave me the stress of the job. The most stress was... I'm not afraid of heights. I was afraid of dropping something out of my hand and hurting someone below. Well, and we didn't have any uh, uh, safety gear as far as falling out of the clock face. Uh, that was that wasn't very good. As you can see here, I'm hanging on to the to a, to a support beam with a foot on another support beam, leaning over to uh, remove one of the hands. That's, this is insane what I was doing there. Is it, would you ever do something like that again? No, not without a little <laughs> harness of some kind.
So you because I'm smarter that now than I was back then. That way. You could have easily tumbled out. Yeah. Well, this was in February of '98, so. So 22 years ago, the safety standards were a lot different. You think? Yeah. Oh yeah. Than today. Oh, I like this one. I always like that picture. Yeah, it was a picture of of me, uh, a completed uh, clock face with the hour and minute hands attached. The minute hand itself is hollow. The hour hand is hollow. The minute hand goes through the hollow tube of the hour hand. And since they move at different rates, they have to be totally independent of each other. And also being hollow, these collector rings here uh, provided electricity to the minute hand and the hour hand outside the building to illuminate them. This is how they powered uh, the hour and minute hands through a series of rings that carried voltage uh, from a central source in the clock tower to each of the four faces and then to these collector rings that transferred the power from the building out to the hands. And a collector ring allows the hands to turn 360 degrees continuously without any tangling of wires or mm. that's that's the main purpose of the collector rings. Mm. And they had to be uh, remachined and polished because they were worn. And to transfer the power from the building to the collector ring, it's a spring-loaded carbon brush. Mm -hmm. uh, and the spring forces tension onto the the carbon, which the carbon pushes onto this copper collector ring, mm -hmm. and that's how they transmit the power. Un and it's uninterrupted. It's cool. Yeah. Forgot about this, some of these things. Oh, and this, this is a plate. There's another plate with a drive shaft connected that bolts to this plate. And then the drive shaft goes to a universal joint, which is this red piece here in case there's any misalignment. So to keep the four faces exactly the same time, being 60 holes in this plate and 60 holes in the plate that, that marry up to this, you can adjust each clock face independently uh, to the exact time and have all four faces show the exact time simultaneously. Hmm. It's a way of timing everything. That's cool. And and following this, this shaft here to the center of the clock tower is a trunnion. And a trunnion is it's 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 four um, gears in mesh with a with a with a large single gear to transmit the power to all the four faces equally. So the other thing I did was also since no maintenance was done on these. Uh, at these bearing surfaces out here, in here, and, and here, anything that turns, I, it's, it was equipped and I equipped it with a, a force feed lubrication system, grease lubrication system. So, and you can set the pressure that you want the grease to go into the bearing or into the or into the uh, bushing and um, what that allows is you don't have to go up there so frequently to grease things and to lubricate things that's cool so then i did the south face first i think then the west facing and then the east facing i think that we were on the north side face and we had to we had to hoist this whole mechanism up with a rope yeah, here's a there's a nice shot too of everything but uh, one of the electricians and here gives you an idea of how big the hands are how much do they weigh do you know 
they're aluminum, so they don't. Okay. They're not hundreds of pounds. There may be a hundred pounds. So this is the stairway that leads up to the clock tower from from the eighth floor. From mm -hmm. this rope, here's one of the clock units. They pulled it up by hand through the center of the spiral case. Yeah. And one of the electricians that were working with us. Uh, got it halfway up and dropped it and let it go back down and he brought it back. I just I had, I had finished it Everything was ready to install and he brought it back in pieces in a box. Oh, no So it had to be all redone redone uh, All re-welded. Were you mad? No, so I was disappointed Yeah, because you probably spent a lot of time working on it. Yeah, Took 22 months to finish this job. It's a long time. Oh, and here's a here's a picture of the clock tower, the steeple of the clock tower, and there's a little trap door here to to raise and lower the flag on the flagpole that's <laughs> that's on the top of the city hall. And what it is is there's this is filled with signatures of people that have been up there doing work. I've seen signatures from the 20s, wow. the 30s, from the 40s, all up uh, etched in, in the in the dome. Did you guys put your signature? No, there? no. But what I did do on the south facing clock face, I made a tag uh, when when the face was rebuilt and and who it was rebuilt by, which was me. See, <laughs> oh, yeah. if you keep going up up. That dome I showed you is here, but as far as this goes, all these arms were cast to form the support system for the hour and minute hands. And this was a flat plate of, of steel. I think it was half or three quarter inches thick and it was flame cut because it was all jagged yet all rough. Mm -hmm. But uh, everything that supports the hour and minute hand and this whole mechanism comes off this plate. And this plate then is attached with I-beams at three places on each side. So there's three here and there will be three on the other side. That's what holds the whole thing together. What's an I-beam? It's, it's used, it's structural. It's used in, in construction of, of large buildings. Mm -hmm. That's an I-beam, it's made of steel. Hmm. But the east facing face, clock face. This is in yeast, this is facing south. But anyway. How can you tell? Just see this this oh. roof that goes off the back. I know that that goes north. Mm -hmm. So if this is south, this is east, west. But the east facing clock face, this huge clock face, was so deteriorated and rusted, they were afraid the face was going to fall out of the building. Oh my gosh. So they strategically I think it's in four places. They took these large cables tied to the clock face and pulled pulled these cables into the building so this face could never fall out. Yikes. Yeah. It bad. was it was because water gets in here, starts rotting this frame, and it was so far gone that they had to do something to prevent the face from falling out to people below and each face had scaffolding permanently attached to it for maintenance and to work on and for the electricians to change the lighting in the hands there was scaffolding at each of the four faces which was nice yeah well i rebuilt the faces i mean the, the mechanisms but I needed help installing. Uh, so it was basically the blacksmith, another machinist, uh, Dennis Callies, who was the lead electrician at City Hall, and myself. This is Wayne Johnson. Right now he's the head of the port. He was a, a maintenance person for us. Now he's the Port director, or port, port of Milwaukee. So he worked his way up. Yeah. As did I.
what's the value of working hard even when the odds are stacked against you? Well, you got to go home knowing you gave the best you could that day. And I guess pride is part of it too. Um, they want to be known as a person that does the best he can all the time. And for the most part, 99% of the time, uh, the people I'm doing work for or with are happy with what I'm doing. So it's not all about the money, but I liked what I was doing. There's history about the... I don't know who gave me this, to be honest with you, or, or who it came from. Not sure. It had to have been somebody at the city. But these are these are things that was returned from. See the first south facing um, clock frame, or was returned from our shop, mm -hmm. uh, November seventeenth, no October seventeenth of ninety seven. So the list of things are threads were machined. Be machined because they were stripped. Brass collector rings were refinished. New sealed bearings replaced the old bearings. New lubrication system. More direct passage to the moving parts was engineered. Bushings were replaced. The old housing was sandblasted and painted. And then I'm not going to read all of this. But was Your not. Names in it. Yeah, my name's in it. But like it says here, uh, the maintenance manager at the time when I mm -hmm. did this job of City Hall, uh, every three months they were to go there and, and look at the, the, the mechanisms themselves and check them and make sure they were lubricated. So that was nice to know that my work my, and my efforts didn't go to waste as far as mm -hmm. being neglected. I, I, I took it, I was surprised and I took, it was, I was honored that um, my boss that hired me uh, sent me out on this job because there were many other machinists in the shop at the time. He could have sent anyone, but he chose me. Now, and I don't, to this day, I don't know why, but... Mike? Mike, Mike Chinesky, yeah. He... I don't, know. I don't know, saw something in me or whatever, I don't know. But I wasn't going to let him down or anybody else. So, taken uh, to repair the clock, it says here in Milwaukee Journal, June 28, 1999. Preparing the four phase clock took 22 months. Uh, myself uh, made some replacement parts, new, the change, replaced all the gears the bushings and the bearings, and we did the shafts. Um, the clock is approximately 300 feet above the pavement. Wow. Just, well, this, yeah, Joseph uh, Jacobson was the management facilities engineer at the time I worked with him. A very nice man, and we pretty much agreed on on his ideas and my ideas. Mm -hmm. It says here, the last time the clock received this much attention was in 1932. Wow. And the original clock to make it work was pneumatic. It was air driven, not electrically driven. And the clock's insides were replaced in 1922. Mm -hmm. So it would run on electricity instead of compressed air. Oh. I had no idea. And Solomon Juno, uh, Milwaukee's first mayor, uh, this was part of his legacy, this clock. It says here a lot of the parts were one of a kind, and that's true because there were weird uh, gear tooth uh, 
not standardized. It was I had to have gears uh, specially made to replace the ones that were worn. So it's here, wind had warped the hands on the clock's west face, which that makes sense. The prevailing wind around here is west southwest in summer. So they were replaced in August of 1997. And then here they talk about the main gearbox, uh, the drive mechanism for all four faces. And I have to go through that too and replace gears, shafts, bearings, and seals for that. Mm. Yeah, this is probably, this is a letter from Evelyn George. I worked at her husband's repair shop out of high school. He had an automotive repair shop. And it's, it, I left there a long time ago, but she still remembered me. And uh, she sent me a letter after she read the article in the Milwaukee, City of Milwaukee Journal about the car. Because I worked by uh, her husband's uh, automotive repair shop in 1975-76. They <laughs> taught me a lot. I, I liked working there, but it didn't pay yeah. so good. But the environment was perfect. I worked at Bob George's. I applied at Rexnor. A little story about Rexnor and perseverance and really going after what you want. I would, I went there on a Monday to apply. This was Rexnor Manufacturing. They made rock brushes and they had a lot of machinists opening or machinist positions. So I went there on a Monday, filled out application releases. Fine, thank you, thank you for applying. And, so goodbye. So I went back there. I didn't hear anything from them. So I went back the following Monday and filled out another application. Gave it to the lady. She said, fine, thank you. You know, mm -hmm. we'll keep you in mind. I didn't hear anything for the week of that, that week. So I went there on the third Monday in a row. And I says, I'd like an application. And the lady says, we have two on file already. She got to know me. <laughs> I says, I don't care. I want to fill out another application. I want to work here. So then she says, just have a seat in the waiting room. So she went off to another office area, came back, and this other gentleman followed her. And he says, come into my, into my office. And we had a short interview there. And he says, we don't have any machinist openings at this time. What we do have is a second shift janitor's position in the fabricating shop. Would you be interested in that? I said, yes, I would be. Knowing that once I get into the system there, whether you're a janitor, a chip wheeler, a machine oiler, you can post and move on different jobs. And that's what I did. I must have worked in well, at least four other departments uh, and, and, and ended up running a, a Good paying, family sustaining, uh, making that wage on a particular machine that I was running. So you're saying if you want something, you can't be too proud or arrogant to start from the bottom and Correct. find your way up. Correct. And actually, it would be a poor decision to be too proud or arrogant to start from the bottom work your way up because you're closing opportunities. Oh, a lot of them. And I started with the city at the bottom. I, I was at where I wanted to be at Rexnor, got laid off in 82. Had no, I had part-time cleaning job after that, but then I applied at the bottom rung again at the city as a laborer and I was accepted. So I became a laborer, a lead worker in the uh, streets maintenance department and then i went to water department be equipment operator that within the water department i went to uh, being a maintenance worker for water distribution and the rest is history you just got to be able to put your pride aside and uh, get your foot in the door and be attentive and work hard. And I did a lot of schooling 
-hmm. And then I was, uh, after Rexnor laid me off and then went to, for a lot of schooling. Like what did you, uh, what did you learn? Machine trades, math. Uh, I even got into uh, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. I went to courses for that, many courses for that, because I thought I didn't know if I'd ever find another machinist job after being laid off. So I was ready to choose a different career. Well, when you were doing that HVAC stuff, I remember testing you on your yeah, yeah, milk cans and stuff. yeah. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Well, sounds like you've had a fascinating career. Yeah, I worked a lot of different places, and I learned a lot. So, Is there any other words of wisdom or tidbits you'd like to share today? Yeah, never give up. <laughs> yep. That's good advice. Go after something you you know you like doing. And if you find that job, hopefully it's a family sustaining job. Uh, you got it made. Well thanks for taking all the time to talk to me about this today. I appreciate it. And pull out all your documents and photographs. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for interviewing me. Uh -huh. Thanks, Love you. Love you too. That's going to be so good. The kids are going to learn so much, Dad. Yeah.